Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good, good. <laughs> um, so we're here today to talk about how video kills the TV ad, or rather, if video kills the TV ad. But before we dig in to the kind of the meat of the topic, um, I'd love 30 seconds to hear about yourselves and your background and your own businesses, just to make um, to kind of level set. Andreas or Sarah? Ladies yeah, first. Ha Ladies first. first. Uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm Sarah from Unruly. Um, we work with 90% of top brands to help them get their videos watched, tracked, shared across the open web. Uh, we predict virality, so we know which videos are going to be going viral and why and where and with who. Uh, and then we also have a big network, 1.35 billion users globally, and we can help make sure the videos are seen by the right people. Great. Yes, hi, I'm Andreas, CTO of Pixability. We are a provider of video ad targeting and measurement solutions, specializing on the big walled garden platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and most recently Twitter. So we have proprietary technology that gets the very best campaign performance out of video ad campaigns on these platforms uh, along paid, earned, and owned media. Great. So clearly, we're here with two pioneers in this space, two pioneers in video. But you know, we've been given this topic around videos kill the TV ad, but we don't necessarily need to agree with it. Do you, where, what's your stance on, on that question? I think it's a great headline, yeah. <laughs> a great kind of session. Explains yeah. why there's so many people in the audience. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but, uh, has video killed the TV ad? Did video really kill the radio star? I know. No, because uh, <laughs> our, our media habits are much more creative than that. Uh, and there's lots of space for more than one medium platform to evolve together. Uh, I do think that video has the potential to transform the TV ad uh, in lots of very positive ways uh, in terms of the quality of the content. Uh, why do I think that? Because on digital, brands have to try really, really hard. Uh, and they have to earn attention. It's so cluttered. It's so crowded. Uh, we're overwhelmed with content from friends and with brands. Um, so we're, we're working with lots of brands who are investing in working out what it is that makes content work. Right. If you apply those learnings to TV, then we could have much better TV ads uh, that don't suck. OK, good. Well, that's a good start, TV ads <laughs> that don't suck. Another headline. I like it. Andreas, what do you reckon? Yes, I think we are in the middle of a multi-year, maybe multi-decade process of uh, getting out of the mentality of just showing a random commercial to as many undifferentiated eyeballs as possible. And I think marketers have started to understand that that's not a good idea, that you can do much better with today's targeting technology on all these uh, online video platforms, even in something like the addressable TV. And uh, what we are currently seeing in the US market is that a lot of big advertisers, including Procter & Gamble, Walmart, General Motors, and so on, are increasingly pulling out of these big upfront deals for TV advertising. They want to be more flexible. They want to be able to uh, invest your money on a tactical basis into the highest performing platforms, be it TV, be it addressable TV, and of course, online video. And I think uh, the market is just getting a lot more sophisticated around how to best get a video message to the right audience, and that's obviously a very very positive development. Yeah, and, and from, from my perspective, I don't think TV ad advertising is dead. It's, it's not dead. I mean, look, it's still a tremendous vehicle for reach and scale and eyeballs. I think TV is how you, oftentimes you get someone to know about a brand, and digital is how you get someone to fall in love with your brand. Um, but there are budget shifts towards digital, excuse me, towards video, uh, online video specifically coming out of the, lion, the lion's share, which is, which is TV budgets. But when it comes to video, then you've got views and you've got engagement. Views are tr traditionally the metric of success, but are you seeing a shift towards engagement as being that number because views are being, you know, you can buy views, they're seen as a vanity yeah. metric? Absolutely. Um, all views are not created equal. Uh, if you just buy on views and measure on views, you're in a fantastic race to the bottom right. for cheap views and yeah. low quality. <laughs> um, so we would always say to brands and agencies, don't don't be, of course, count views, but think about the quality of the views. Think what happens afterwards. So we focus a lot on sharing at Unruly. Yeah. Uh, I think the share is the gold standard for social. If somebody shares your content, then that means they really believe in it. They're prepared to, prepared to put their own personal brand behind it and share it with their networks, uh, and, and that's huge. Uh, but then also think about what those shares deliver, because shares alone can just be seen as the next level of vanity metric. metric. So you want a valuable virality. Um, great to get your video shared. Great to have people delivering word of mouth, but what is the business value? And that's where we're seeing brands focusing their attention now. Interesting. Mm -hmm. well, we, we see with a lot of our clients that they are really going through a, a learning process, a learning curve. They often start out with uh, this goal of reaching as many views as possible, as cheaply as possible. Then they start really looking at uh, performance and the business value of their campaigns. And uh, they often then go towards more quality-oriented metrics, like video completion rates, for instance, and then develop into engagement metrics. And finally, 
Um, metrics are really about audience loyalty, like cost per subscriber for a subscriber to a YouTube channel, for instance, earned views, uh, brand impact on, in terms of how do people on YouTube produce content about your brand based on what they have seen on your channel. So this is really a learning curve that brands have to go through, often takes years, but I think most advanced brands have now really entered this kind of process. And that is one of the challenges of the ecosystem, isn't it? Um, yes. That brands are all at very different levels. Uh, so having a product set that works for all those different moments in their exactly, evolution yes. is, is challenging yeah. for any tech company. Yeah. <laughs> we have a huge portfolio of, of different clients who look at very different KPIs. It's really mm. not one size fits all, but uh, this is also something that makes it interesting because brands can learn from other people's best practices, mm. and I think that's really what's going on in the industry currently. Uh, and it's almost a case of no matter where a brand is in, in the landscape, they want to go viral, right? You know, chief marketing officers love the concept of virality and going viral. You know, you've got the Red Bulls of the world, you've got the Volvo truck with Jean-Claude Van Damme doing the splits at 82 million views right now, it's insane. And you, you, you spoke about virality, but it's not, it's not easy to go viral, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So what is the secret sauce and how do you predict the, the shareability and that vir virality? So it's, it's great to, that you say it's not easy. Exactly, it's not. Um, it's not easy. Well, it's, it's not easy, it's getting harder as the web is more cluttered, as our social feeds are more cluttered. Um, it's also getting harder as people's sharing habits change. So five, six years ago, we were sharing uh, with everybody. Everyone was very happy to share content with all their friends, all their groups. Uh, now we've seen a real increase in, in, in narrow cash sharing, one-to-one -one sharing, often using messaging apps. We were just hearing yeah. about that from the Glide guy earlier on. Um, so there's a real change in consumer behavior. Um, but in terms of what the ingredients are that drive shareability, uh, we have our share rank algorithm, it predicts virality, over 100 variables fed into that. Uh, we've got a data set of over 2 trillion views uh, and consumer panels sitting behind that so we can, uh, we can benchmark norms. Uh, the two key things to think about are emotional intensity and diversity of social motivations. So how, how strongly does a bit of content make you feel? Mm. So don't worry about whether it's got a cat in it or a dog. Um, don't there's nothing <laughs> wrong with a cat and a dog in a video. <laughs> Don't spend too much time thinking about the cat, uh, because actually there's no independent correlation between cats and shareability. Yeah. Um, there's just a survivor fallacy there. If you look at the most successful, the very most successful ads, you'll see the, out the outliers, uh, and you'll see them, and you'll see there might be a cat, there might be a celebrity. What you don't see is the hundreds of thousands of other, yeah. <laughs> other cat ads that are sitting down there not delivering any shares. <laughs> so emotional intensity and then social motivations. This is things like um, zeitgeist, um, wanting to help people, uh, varies massively by market. So in the US, for example, the most common motivation to share is shared passion, and that's people wanting to instill their place within a tribe. In the UK, it's very practical. Uh, so in the UK, they share because they want to um, be useful and share a service or a product. Uh, in Australia, Japan, very different again. Japan, it's all about opinion seeking. So really think about the market, think about the demographic when you're wanting to create content with reality in mind. That's really, really, really interesting. And then. When you think about different markets, right, we also think about different platforms. And when I think of video, traditionally, I've always thought of YouTube as being the, you know, it almost has a monopoly on the marketplace and from a percep perception perspective. But Facebook video, and I, Andreas, we were talking about this backstage a little bit, Facebook video is growing massively. In fact, last night it hit uh, 8 billion daily views, which is up from 4 billion daily views in April, which is nuts. Yes. Um, I mean, how are you seeing that platform differ from YouTube, given the, the, the heritage of your company, which has been yeah. to focus on YouTube? Right. Well, we are just uh, now in the process of aggressively expanding into Facebook videos, simply because that's where a lot of the audience is going. And it is quite different in the sense that Facebook doesn't have a sense of um, a place like a YouTube channel, where you find a certain context of a certain type of content. Uh, Facebook is really about your personalized feed, and this has a lot of advantages because you can target people very, very specifically based on their demographics, their interests, and so on. But contextual targeting is not something that exists on uh, Facebook yet, and Facebook has started to invest a lot into content deals, into uh, features that give pe people a certain contextual environment because they see that this is really important to grow their video business further. So I think what is currently happening is that both these platforms are really competing head-to-head, -head, very aggressively against each other, and this has also moved uh, YouTube quite 
uh, a lot in terms of speeding up their innovation speed. They have come out with a lot of new things, uh, both on the advertising side and on the consumer experience side. And we believe that's really positive because both uh, platforms obviously have a lot of resources. They have very capable technologists. And um, this is really positive for the video ecosystem overall, that these giants now innovate very rapidly with the best they can bring to the table and are trying to emulate the other strengths, relatively speaking. Who's going to win, Facebook video or YouTube? I think there's, there's room for both. They have their individual strengths, and uh, when you look at usage, then uh, people really you know, divide their attention between these platforms. Um, it, it's interesting that uh, both platforms have started to go into specialized apps for content consumption. For instance, YouTube has recently launched a specialized app just for video gamers and is looking at a specialized app for music. Facebook, on the other hand, is doing similar things. Instagram is a big deal, obviously, in the Facebook ecosystem. So uh, I think we are seeing a uh, phase of experimentation right now that will at some point in a few years boil down to the most successful patterns. But right now, it's a very interesting space to be in because there's so much going on. The yeah. products change almost every week, and yeah. uh, that needs you know, technology like the one that we provide to keep up with that change. Good. Also worth remembering that when you think about where viewers are actually watching video, about a quarter of views taking place on Facebook and YouTube, the rest of them taking place on the open web. Yeah, <laughs> so these are the, the billion plus other sites where we're all watching, consuming video. Uh, so there are, the, the ecosystem is extremely diverse. Uh, and although we talk a lot uh, about just a few platforms, uh, there's a lot more below that when you scratch the surface. Uh, for me, I think Facebook uh, needs to be more than a conduit. It needs to be a destination. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is making exactly. strides in that direction. Um, and there's a massive uh, opportunity in terms of revenue for Facebook. Uh, you know, how they monetize those 8 billion <laughs> uh, video streams still remains to be seen. Yeah, it's, it's interesting as well, about 8 billion views. And, uh, you know, each platform defines a view differently. Facebook defines a view as three seconds, whereas YouTube defines a view as 30 seconds. So it's, it's not apples to apples. But I, I did want to follow up on a point about the, the fact that there are so many different distribution platforms for video beyond those, those two big boys. Um, and I wanted to ask about how a creative agency or a brand needs to change their creative assets for the different platforms. Because it's not a case anymore that you can just get your TV ad and throw it on YouTube and you know, have it live there and have it be a success more often than not. It's really about a, a case of creating content for Snapchat video, for Instagram video. But budgets aren't limitless. Yeah. What's your advice to clients um, or you know, agency folks who are in the room about that. I think it's important that clients and agencies uh, get out of the mindset of having these siloed types of agencies. We often still see that a client works with a creative agency, they produce this re really amazing 30 second commercial, throw them over the wall to the media agency and then tell the media, just okay, get it seen now by the right target audience. And that's a real challenge on these uh, video platforms because the same creative that performs well on TV will fall flat on YouTube in a skippable format and will be a disaster on Facebook where it starts auto playing without sound. So what we see um, the most successful brands doing is really uh, bring together their agencies. Uh, some clients even take some of the creative and even media buying in-house because they believe in integration and uh, really specialize the creative for each platform. Can still be the same campaign with the same themes. That's absolutely a given, obviously. But you have to optimize creative and media buying strategies for the strengths of each of these platforms. Mm. There's been a lot of talk about the ad tech stack and the technology stack, SSPs, DSPs, DMPs, yeah, so yeah. much technology out there. <laughs> a I lot of acronyms. acronyms. This is the stage for acronyms, right? <laughs> so, many, uh, so many bits of the technology stack are related to advertising and targeting. Um, but the next frontier is the content stack uh, and how you create assets for all the different platforms and then feed it through into the ad tech stack. Uh, and this is where a lot of the focus is going to be in 2016, I believe. Uh, when we work with brands, uh, often before they've created any content, they're thinking about their emotional palette, mm. uh, and they're thinking about how do we want people to feel, who else is doing this well in our space, yeah. uh, and thinking about making that emotional connection. Then when we test content, we can see which is the image that really resonates, what are the, what's the language that resonates, who are the characters that resonate, and then you can use that intel to think about how you might cut down a video, how you might repurpose it for skippable, mm. or for silent, yeah. uh, or for a GIF, or for a, yeah, for a thumbnail, all these different ways uh, of taking one holistic 
simplistic idea uh, and then dicing and slicing in order to get the best results. Yeah. Yeah, we see exactly the same thing. So uh, increasingly, brands are skeptical about the creative director's brilliant idea and uh, really want to see very tangible, granular data about what really works for an audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the right way to approach it. Agreed. Yeah. Data-driven creativity is the way forward. doesn't mean we don't need creatives, no, um, but there is a definitely a place for creativity and data to work together. Exactly. Interesting. So you, you mentioned 2016. and. Um, and uh, I mean, I would love to know your perspectives on if we were having this conversation this time next year, what will we be talking about or what are your predictions? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flag one, which is around just the continued explosion of native content. Mm -hmm. Even the fact that there's a marketing stage at the summit and a content stage, so many of the talks could actually live on both. So I, I'm seeing we're obviously native, co native content, branded content in the video space. But what's your one or two tips or themes that are emerging from the day to day? So um, messaging apps, huge. Um, lots more video being consumed and shared through messaging apps. That's one. Uh, secondly, the coming of the adpocalypse, <laughs> which we talk a lot about. So basically, ad blocking and the rise in ad blocking uh, is leading to the development of new, more user-centric, consumer-friendly ad formats. Um, the IAB's Lean Ads Program, and that's an, ac that's an acronym. <laughs> yes. Uh, Whoever's playing uh, acronym bingo out there. Cha ching uh, it stands for lean, encrypted, uh, ad choice supported, um, non-invasive. So we're going to see more ad formats like that being developed. Uh, and most importantly, I think we're going to see a joining of the dots. But maybe this is just what I hope we'll see. Because uh, I think next year isn't going to be necessarily about big ideas. The brands that succeed are going to be the ones that can join the dots between all the different parts, getting all those different content yeah. creators, working together with the data, getting the right content, it's going through those ad, ad tech pipes uh, to the right people. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, fully agree. And uh, I would add, it's really essential for brands to uh, experiment in a very focused way and, and try many different things and accept that some of these experiments will go wrong because uh, traditional brands are still very used to deploying a lot of money on something they believe that works and that's fine. But uh, in this changing environment, you really ha almost have to think like a venture capitalist. You have to place your bets on several different things that may or may not work, and you have to assign some budget to that and, and put some creative energy into that to see what really resonates with your brand on, uh, in a certain environment on certain platforms. And, and we see brands doing quite creative things. For instance, one of our clients is, is L'Oreal, and they work together with video bloggers on YouTube, beauty bloggers, and uh, they let them produce video um, tutorials about makeup and let them even use competitive products. So if the vlogger says, uh, I really love L'Oreal's lipstick, but I hate their mascara, and here's a different product that I'm allowed like much better, L'Oreal is fine with paying for that because that's the kind of authenticity that you really need in this kind of environment. So getting over these old uh, ways of doing things and of, of thinking about performance and predictability is essential if you want to win in this environment. And you can experiment cheaply. Yes. So you don't need to be like a uh, series BVC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like seed funding. You can, this is one of the great things about digital, and this is why digital has the power to transform the TV ad, mm -hmm. because you can seed on digital, see what works, experiment there, and then scale it. And and it would be amazing if we could scale the Super Bowl. You know, that, that one day a year in the US when 100 million people come watch ads where the ads are the content, the content is kick-ass, the content is, the ad content is often better than the game itself. That's true. Um, and this year for the first time, more than half of people who saw Super Bowl ads saw them on digital. Yep. Um, so we are seeing the opportunity for TV and digital to drive engagement across both platforms. Uh, we're seeing the same in, with Christmas ads and holiday ads, uh, where brands creating content that people really want to share and are looking for to like the John Lewis ad because that's the start of Christmas for lots of people and it'd be great to have lots more moments like that where brands really stepped up and said come on let's create an event uh, and let's make our advertising so awesome that people will want to come and watch it. Yeah, that, that's a great point. That, uh, when you look at the most successful UGC creators, they are all cross-platform by now. They are on YouTube, they're on Facebook, yeah. they're on Instagram. And I think brands can really learn from that, how you play to the right kind of audience with a particular style that really works in an environment. Yeah, yeah I've seen a lot of them. Um, I've seen a really interesting pattern around what we call tease, anchor, amplify, where we're teasing for our campaigns. We're teasing the campaigns on um, Snapchat and Vine. We're anchoring the campaign actually on YouTube. We're amplifying the campaign on Facebook and Twitter. And then once we have those learnings, like you said, then we'll actually launch it above the line TV and really, really go to town with a bigger paid media spend. So very interesting. So uh, we, we're coming to the very end of it, but Sarah, I wanted to ask you, First, I want to say congratulations on the acquisition with News Corp a while ago. Oh, thank you. But I wanted to, to know how, how, has the, how, have you, how have you integrated with, with News Corp, or how has that acquisition affected you day to day? 
Well, um, we've been growing at Unruly um, for a while, growing organically, really enjoying what we do, loving innovating, loving our, uh, working with the whole team. We have an amazing culture. Um, so we weren't looking um, to sell, we weren't looking for an exit. Um, but when the news team approached us, um, we do what we always do, which is we look to our vision, we look to our values, and we say, well, does this fit? And our vision is to transform digital advertising for the better. And we thought, yeah, well, with the fantastic media that news have and their commitment to digital transformation and innovation, we absolutely good. Uh, so in that sense, um, it was a very strong strategic fit. Um, the other thing we really liked was um, their track record of turbo-boosting companies they acquire whilst leaving them autonomous and mm. leaving them to run independently. Uh, and to us, that was attractive uh, because we love our own really culture. Uh, we, you know, we, we travel at the speed of light uh, and we, we're agile, we're very much a developing a development culture, we come out of extreme programming, uh, so we're very collaborative and we wanted to make sure that we kept all that good stuff. Good. Well, the clock's just hitting zero, 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 and at the risk of any more acronyms, let's call it a day. Sarah and Andreas, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.